aflibercept has sort of cemented itself as standard of care for most of these patients for a long time. And Hawk and Harrier seems to be the first real data that has posed any sort of challenge uh, in that capacity to its role as standard of treatment. What does this newest analysis tell us about the way proluxizumab uh, impacts patients compared to aflibercept? The analysis that I presented actually uh, hits on two major points. The, the first point is that um, we make assessments in the office as retina specialists based upon anatomy, uh, most, most commonly, and then vision. Um, if the anatomy is abnormal, then we tend to inject patients. If the vision is abnormal, we tend to inject patients. And one of the beauties of the, of the Hawk and Harrier trials actually was that they looked to see what the doctors did with regards to their treatment decisions. So how did you change a patient from a longer interval of treatment with brolocizumab at 12 weeks and a disease adjust or treatment adjust them down to eight weeks? And what they found essentially was that it was uh, the majority of those decisions were based upon anatomy. Um, some of them were based upon uh, visual acuity. And in, importantly, I think that we find that the anatomy and vision match up a pretty good amount. About 75% of the time does anatomy and vision match up with each other. But about 25%, it doesn't match up at all. So we have to use both of these parameters as retina specialists to kind of uh, inform ourselves about treatment decisions with these patients. And so we use both anatomy and vision in the office to kind of make these decisions with regards to the patients. Um, the second thing that was really determined in the Hawk and Harrier trials was the superiority with regards to anatomy and uh, its ability to dry the retina with Brolocism in comparison to a flibercept. And at many different time points, this was evaluated on a head-to-head -head fashion. And what they found essentially is what we looked at these disease activity assessments, these uh, assessments of activity of the eye based upon vision or OCT or what have you, were far less fewer in the brolocizumab arms in comparison to the flibrocept arms in the course of the trial. And so while, you know, your point to the, that right now the gold standard or the, the treatment of choice right now is a flibrocept, clearly brolocizumab had some advantages in the Hawk and Harrier trial with regards to these activities as you measure it by either vision or OCT. All right, thank you for that. And yeah, it definitely adds some interesting data points to the discussion. How does this data specifically impact how clinicians might decide between choosing aflibercept or brolocizumab for their patients going forward? So it's, it's an important finding. Uh, clearly, we know that there's lots of patients out there with persistent fluid uh, in with uh, Avastin or uh, Bevacizumab, Lucentis, or Ranibizumab, or even ILEA and aflibercept. The, the question becomes is, is this a great patient to transition to brolocizumab? Um, probably some of the more recent safety data is a little bit of pause to retina specialists. And so we're trying to evaluate what that means for our patients with regards to some of the safety data in and around brolocizumab. As you may be aware, there was a rate of occlusive vasculitis that appears to be between one in 10,000 and one in 20,000. Uh, though that's not something that we see commonly in our patients with other anti-VEGF therapy right now. So I think it's, it's, it still needs to be hashed out. I don't think that there's a truly good answer for that. I think the answer is that we're gonna learn over the next few months to a year about what the true safety aspects are with brolocizumab and how that might impact our decision-making with these patients. Well, I think there's definitely gonna be a lot of people looking forward to that data when it becomes available. Mm -hmm. And now, just lastly, was there any sort of strengths or limitations that you would like to touch on from this analysis that you think it's important that clinicians keep in mind when interpreting this data? Yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately uh, what you're seeing is a little bit of discordance between anatomy and vision. And that's, I think, one of the more important findings. It may be new to some of your audience members who are watching this interview now. They might not be aware that the OCT doesn't always equate to visual acuity. And so I think that's a real good learning point for us that even in the best uh, OCT uh, technology, spectral domain OCT, there's still a disconnect between anatomy and vision with regards to those patients. Uh, and then that points out, I guess, some better um, um, technologies need to come about to tell us about disease activity. You know, one of the things we learned through this pandemic is we don't have a home OCT, we just have home visual acuity, right? And so if we can come up with a technology that might give us a better assessment of these activity over time, maybe we'd be better off uh, using that for home monitoring or even in clinical trials and design 
studies around um, the ability to have patients monitor their vision at home, what that might mean to them over time. The biggest advantage of Berluxizumab is the gap in treatment intervals that it allows for patients, uh, especially in a time like we're in now with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. How much of an advantage would it does it provide patients to be able to have that length and time between treatments? Oh, I think the idea that we could lengthen the treatment interval of these anti-VEGFs is huge. I mean, we have data now that is suggestive that we can go out to even uh, 16 or even 20 weeks with some of the drugs we have available currently in the market space. Um, and I think with this, if you can imagine that 12 week or beyond interval of treatment that might be possible with these drugs, it's a huge benefit to not come back to clinic for a three month period of time because you can imagine that that surge of patients who have this disease uh, may be flattened by them. And that would be a huge advantage for patients returning in a three month interval rather than returning in a monthly or or bi-monthly interval potentially.